If I had enough money to buy the materials, that's as much as I needed. I thought I was doing a cartoon until I saw that first really rough, rough, rough cut. I was like, oh my God, it's great. I would get the, what the studio would consider to be the oddball project, something that didn't really fit into the traditional kind of generic frame. And RoboCop was certainly one of those pictures. I'm the production designer, and my job was to sort of um, give a look to the picture and keep, what I always feel is to keep a cohesive look to the picture. There was a constant in design, very brutal, cold architecture. You'll see there's a constant line of concrete wherever we go that's just boring but linear and kind of visually interesting and structural to me. It's clean, so there's no information that you don't want to see. Let's say you're shooting um, people at the base of a hill and you want to put a castle on, the, on that hill. Well, you could build one, right, and get a prop and put a lot of money into it. Or you could hire a very good matte painter, a man who could take a piece of glass and then paint at the top of the glass that castle and then you would actually put the frame of glass in front of the camera and shoot your live action. Rocco Geoffrey, who did the matte paintings for Robocop, uh, had a different technique. Uh, he didn't like to use glass and he used masonite, masonry boards, and he would paint right on those, mainly because uh, he was always dropping the glass and breaking the glass mats. So a matte shot, in the traditional sense, the oldest way to do it, is a controlled double exposure where you shoot the live action you're blacking out part of the frame, and black represents a lack of exposure. You go back in the darkroom, rewind that film, and reload that on a pedestal-mounted, locked-off camera that's pointing at an artwork easel. And that artwork easel contains your matte painting, which is black now in the complementary portion of the frame, and it fits together like two pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And it takes a certain number of tests, usually about four to six camera tests, before you get your painting to blend properly with the live action. In a situation with an architectural matte painting, you usually try and find um, areas that you'll be able to hide your blend in, and you go along with the architectural lines as best as possible. I'd rather cut into the set and paint a portion of that back in, because more often people are looking for a matte line on the outside perimeters of the set piece, not within the set itself. They were going to be shooting in Dallas, Texas, and they wanted it to look like um, Detroit in the near future. Bill Sandell, the production designer, and John Davison and Paul Verhoeven had singled out the City Hall in Dallas, and they wanted that to be the base of an 80-story skyscraper for their OCP building. And so together we came up with an idea of the thing looking kind of like a big arrow that was stabbed into the ground. The, there's a wide shot of Delta City when RoboCop's car is driving away from camera, and we actually shot across the bridge to crossing an area there, and we matted into the existing cityscape, the OCP building, and other futuristic structures. John Davison specifically singled out his favorite shots in Forbidden Planet. He wanted the thing, especially the down angles, to just plunge infinitely, you know, and just have this incredible depth. I believe there are only two matte paintings in RoboCop that aren't done completely in camera on the original negative, and those are the elevator shots because they, we needed to reduce the interior of the Plaza Americas to make it smaller and fit within that gigantic 80-story interior look. Um, so those were optical reductions. Optical reduction is when you take something of previously shot footage and actually reduce it in size to usually put it into something like a matte painting. I'm responsible for um, the fall at the end of the film where Dick Jones is falling toward the street. Dick Jones is an animation puppet, a two-foot-tall human animation stop-motion puppet in that shot. With a human being, you don't want to have him standing at attention with his arms at his sides. You want something that's going to be more um, in keeping with what he's actually going to be doing in the scene. Um, and in the case of Ronnie Cox falling, he was falling spread eagle and kicking on the way down. So. I had his arms out to the side and a slight crouch on him is how the sculpture was done over the top of the armature with plasticine clay. And that finished clay sculpture, you'll make a plaster mold. The clay is thrown away and the armature is taken back down to bare bones metal again. That empty armature is placed inside this mold that's been cleaned out and scrubbed. And those two halves are again put back together. The foam will be injected into the mold when the two halves are joined together with the armature inside of that. And that, in turn, 
is baked like a cake in an oven at 350 degrees for a number of hours until the moisture is evacuated from the foam rubber mixture and um, the thing is allowed to cool down. You pull the two mold halves apart, you end up with a rubber puppet, a very nice soft foam rubber puppet that's a likeness from the um, clay sculpture that you did. And then it's up to you to clean that up, paint the thing, put in some eyeballs and dress it up in the, in the three-piece suit. This is a, you know, just a typical example of an old-fashioned stop-motion puppet. It's either hinge joints in some places or ball and socket joints. I'm just gonna crank this open so you can get a look at typically what a, a ball joint looks like here for stop motion. Please put down your weapon. You have 20 seconds to comply. Since Robocop was effectively a man in a suit, Ed 209 could not be in any way a man in a suit. So that's one of the reasons we chose to offset the hips or do things that would be clearly impossible for a person to fit in that. That's why his hips are so far apart. It's one of the reasons that there's rails. The joints don't have a standard you know, knee joint. They've actually got a linear rail kind of a system that's, again, one step further away from a person in a suit. I felt that they knew so much more about it and they came with the proposal. Then when they came with proposals, I could easily say, okay, but then do this, you know. If we do it this way, then let's make this, 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 this strange thing they had built, which is the gray area. Let's make that the eyes, the whole eyes. This, these are the eyes. There's hundreds of eyes, basically, whatever it is. You can see through that, not by a little camera on, on the top of his head, you know. For the inspiration for Ed 209, we drew upon a, kind of a number of different areas, you know, tried to draw something in, a natural, in the natural world. So uh, killer whales were something that had a pretty menacing kind of a countenance. Everything's kind of an excuse, you know, there's a big air intake and it looks a lot like a mouth. And there's this big dome that you can't really see where the eyes are. The idea there was that this would be maybe like an anti-laser surface. This is kind of the maquette stage and it really is uh, pretty instrumental. The last kind of, last round of design until you uh, blow this thing up to full scale. This is like basically, uh, it's blue foam, it's house insulation foam. You know, you take that, it's cheap and stuff. Um, and you can mix with my favorite toothpicks and soda straws. You kind of build a little version of the robot that you can talk about. The leg, you know, upper leg would be here. It could pivot and then also in order to take a step, the guy could actually shoot his leg forward and then kind of as he's walking forward to do this. So that was pretty critical. You could see through it. There were lots of moving parts. There was a big screw that would be responsible for moving the leg up and down. And then like on the back here, a little bit of a, a plate, uh, the screw access. And we figured since we're gonna have a screw that's in there turning, we might as well put a detail on there. So I modeled the uh, end of the screw to look like one of the axles you see on a railroad car. So as the guy's actually moving, you see these little things spinning. The full scale Ed 209 was a design that Craig had come up with working with Paul Verhoeven and, and myself and trying to get something that, that Paul was happy with as a, as a character, a nemesis for, for RoboCop. The crew that we were building at this time, Pete Ronzani, Neil Breitbart, and Paolo Lucchesi, my girlfriend at the time, we pretty much built that thing together. And uh, it was hell, but it was one of those experiences you come through, and at the end of the day, it's something we always remember. Later on, we'd be married, and so uh, I guess it didn't really split us apart. All the forms were built up out of uh, wood. You know, we used a lot of plywood, masonite, and just fur, and actually kind of built up patterns and stuff bit by bit. We used a lot of uh, plastic forming techniques and fiberglass techniques. And seeing how it was basically the middle of summer in San Rafael, we were pretty much in hell up to our ears in fiberglass and, and wearing these suits because you have to wear these protective suits and respirators and everything else while it's just blistering hot. It's a pretty tough, uh, pretty tough portion there. One of the keys with movie props is they've got to be pretty, um, pretty flexible. You have to be able to put this thing together and take it apart in relatively short order. And actually that's one of the things I'm pretty proud about was the model was held together with bungee cords, um, snaps, and different techniques. So uh, basically two people could take the thing apart. We were pretty much left alone. In fact, for the full scale prop, you know, I don't think Paul, Paul saw it at all until it was delivered, you know, in Dallas. That was pretty cool. I felt pretty trusted. Phil Tippett would check in on us on a periodic basis, come over and see what we're doing, and just kind of <laughs> roll his eyes at the mess we were making and stuff. You know, our hearts were in it so much that, you know, compensation even wasn't necessarily important. Just, you know, contributing to this whole kind of process was really, really the motivation. The full-scale prop was essentially just that, a prop, you know. It was capable of being posed. The head could be swiveled, you know, from side to side. The arms were able to be pivoted. We could rotate them down or rotate them up. But it was really the kind of thing that had limited, very, very limited motion. Because of the size of the big guy, his head was so big that even though we made this pretty reinforced fiberglass mold, 
it still sagged a little bit. So when you see the big one compared to the miniature version, the miniature version is built exactly off the pattern for the big one, but when we molded the big one, it squished just a little bit. So the big guy's head's just a little bit fatter than the miniature version, and actually it's one of those things that always bugged me when I saw it in the film because I recognized they were a little different, but what are you gonna do? Phil Tippett is the man on RoboCop who actually animated the stop motion puppets for ED-209. This is the, the uh, stop motion miniature of the ED-209 puppet that has an articulated stop motion uh, um, a skeleton in it or armature in it. And this is actually part of it. It's actually visible here. And you can see this lead screw mechanism that was part of the design that Craig Hayes had come up with. Then they've made a, a number of miniature puppets uh, that were articulated and had little skeletons inside of them of metal so you could pose them and then this was done through stop motion animation. Every little aspect of this particular character has got a, um, an, an armatured, a jointed part that allows... And shooting one frame of film can, depending upon the complexity of the shot, take, you know, anywhere from can take anywhere from 10 minutes to, uh, you know, an hour and a half, you know, adjusting everything properly for one frame of film. You get your camera, you take one frame, stop the camera, you go onto the little stage, move the arm infinitesimal inch, go back behind the camera, shoot another frame, one frame at a time. Most of the work for Ed 209 was stop motion animation with the exception of the staircase scene, and in particular when he falls down the staircase. The staircase that Ed 209 fell down was a four foot square miniature built of plywood and brass and you know the usual kind of model building materials, reinforced so that when the guy fell down the stairs it didn't shake the set too much. Phil did all of the kind of masterminding of exactly how we we're going to do that, what angle the set would be at to get the best roll and everything, and then we rigged up the puppet with a pin in his foot. and. When we said go, camera was rolling at speed, we'd pull the pin and the robot would tumble down the stairs and off the edge of the set. I was the one catching the robot because I was the one who had to fix it up for the next take. So I wanted to make sure as little stuff broke, you know. So I'd be down there trying to make sure the little thing didn't hit the ground and break off an important part and then I'd have more work to do. <laughs> I came up with this technique that, uh, that Craig Hayes helped me with where I thought, mm, you know, I, I don't want everything to go through like a, a secondary optical pass. I want everything to be on the original negative, if, if that was possible. For Ed 209's, you know, machine guns, we rigged up photographic flashes. And then while I was animating the Ed 209, you animate one frame at a time, one frame at a time, one frame at a time, getting ready to cock his guns or whatever. We took some Minolta flashes apart and rigged up a system where we could put the actual flash tube into the tip of the barrel of Ed 209's gun. And backwind the camera one frame and turn all the lights off on the set. And then we would take cotton, take some uh, you know, colored plastic gel, wrap um, some orange around the thing, and then take some cotton and sculpt what would look like a muzzle flash. And they'd go off, boom. So that you get this thing that looked like a burned, at, burned in kind of a muzzle flash. I put like tons of diffusion on the camera too, for, for those particular frames, not the rest of the stuff, but just for the frames where the flashes were going off. So it didn't look like cotton, it looked like more of a diffused flash. And then I just like randomly, put different shapes in the cotton, so it had the characteristic effect of, of gunfire. It was a pretty interesting technique, but because of the high voltages you know, involved and the sort of somewhat uh, you know, movie-ish quality of the wiring, occasionally they'd get a, a few thousand volt um, shock. And I'd be like working away on the thing, and he never insulated these things well enough. I'd be like right in the middle of doing this thing, and he'd hear the scream, and I was just going to get like these, you know, whatever, like 10,000 volts going through me. It was really wild. I'd been through enough shocks myself that I kind of found it amusing, but I, I don't think they appreciated that at all. Everything's very clear when you get electrocuted. And this is a uh, shot where we actually made a little miniature Robocop. So this was a stop motion Robocop that grabs the gun, and Ed to and I is firing as he gets his arm pointed over to his own arm and actually blows his arm off. This was kind of an interesting shot to achieve because of the way the robot, it's one of the things, the limitations of the robot, he actually technically couldn't shoot his own arm because his head was in the way. So we ended up sort of cheating and you don't see it in the movie, but we unhooked the arm and just kind of pulled it out to the point where he could do it. And you know, it's all a big phony thing. So this shot of him launching his missiles, he had this giant blown off arm, which was a practical part that I built out in San Francisco and had to fly it out to Dallas. And I remember as Phil and I were going out there, I had this big giant blown off robot arm wrapped in some paper and stuff. And they asked me what it was at the airport. And I didn't want to say it was a big giant blown off robot arm. So I said it was a planter and they said, okay, let's put it in there. It's hard to imagine these days, you know, getting a, a giant blown off arm, you know, through any kind of airport security. But 
Back then, it was like whatever. I thought for sure that I'd be able to continue doing matte paintings with a paintbrush and camera trickery um, for the rest of my life. Since RoboCop, yeah, the industry, is, visual effects in particular, have changed so radically. In the digital world, you're in an arena where you have your frame and you can do anything you want with it. You don't have to go have a separate camera shoot something else. You can create it in the digital world right there and you can put it into the frame right there. With the advent of computer graphics and Photoshop matte paintings, uh, the cut and paste methods and just using photo collage. Um, matte painters could, for the most part, start coming out of the woodwork. Um, people that couldn't create a realistic painting with their hands and with a paintbrush were suddenly, um, there, there's just like tons of matte painting artists now. There's a completely different kind of realm of equipment that's necessary and the accessibility, of course. These days, uh, visual effects are done in a variety of ways. You can create something completely from scratch in the computer, build 3D models and light them and so forth, and do that all entirely in the machine. You can go to a store and you could buy the software, the hardware, you know, most of the stuff that you would need to actually do visual effects. I don't know if there was a, uh, if there really is a, um, a need for doing stop motion anymore. Stop motion animation is still around, but certainly in a far diminished capacity. In regards to doing visual effects work, I, I think it's, um, you know, it's been replaced by computer graphics pretty much. I found that um, by the late 1990s, by 1997, that um, early in that year, that for the most part any phone call that I got requesting a matte painting shot, they wanted to know for sure that I was doing it with computer graphics. It's a completely different world. That's the way of Hollywood and the film industry. The technology only reflects, you know, what's current and it's constantly being replaced. You can watch the film nowadays and, and the shots do hold up. One of the biggest compliments for me on the, on the whole project was when my friends who really didn't understand what we did would come over, walk up to this thing and kick it and it was hollow. They'd be shocked, you know, they thought it was a four ton giant robot that we had built. They're actually artists who happen to be working with very sophisticated special effects.